Welcome to Pumpkin Spice Podcast, a seasonal treat for fans of horror films. I'm Rob Schulte, and I'm here with my co-host, good friend, Graham Young. Hey, Graham, what's up, man? How's it going, everybody? I have a little opening question. Are you ready for this? Uh, yeah, concerning Friday the 13th Part 1? Yeah, sure. Okay. And then we'll talk about Part 2. Okay. Oh, this episode's going to be a little bit of a treat since we're starting Season 2. Uh, but let's get more into that in a second. Graham, what is going to be the next wave of Hollywood monsters? Of creatures for the cinema? I mean, if Universal has its way with the dark universe, that that's they're sort of wanting to reinvent their Universal lineup. Um, but as far as uh, the next generation of uh, creature films, that's probably that's a really good question. I have to think about that when we're talking about creature movies or serial killer films. What the fuck is Jason? Is he a zombie? Is he a ghost? <laughs> is he... I, you know, I'm in my 30s now, and I still have no idea what the fuck this guy is. Um, well, and, maybe the journey of season two is will just, be figuring out what Jason is. Sure, because between the first and second films, they really break continuity. And if you are paying attention to the films, uh, besides, you know, the... Uh, uh, watching all the kills, you'd notice that the continuity goes right out the door uh, on the second one. And then the third one just is insane. But the the first three are intended to be a trilogy and they all follow kind of the same story. And then uh, with four, five, and six, we have the Jarvis character um, that sort of ties four, five, and six together. I feel that most everyone's seen part one. Even if you haven't seen part one, it's probably been spoiled for you, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Everybody knows the twist. Okay, so, Graham, uh, a new thing I want to introduce in Pumpkin Spice Podcast, the 30-second summary. Do you think you can do it? I think I can do it in 30 seconds or less. Okay. On your mark, get set, go. In 1958, a young boy drowns. The camp counselors fail to recognize a drowning boy in the lake. And uh, 30 years later, the mom of the boy, Mrs. Voorhees, uh, wreaks havoc on a group of teenagers that visit the camp on a sunny summer afternoon. Yeah, I think that pretty much does it. But the only things I, guess, I would I did say, my best there. Hey, man, you got 30 <laughs> seconds. I, I, I had you on the spot. But what really, what really matters is that the twist is that you think it's uh, a, a lumbering dude the whole time, and it ends up being this mother, and that was kind of cool. Uh, what made this like different than other horror movies at the time? Probably just the graphic violence in the film was sort of set this film apart from other horror film, contemporary horror. Yeah, films people did want to see those. Yeah, people wanted to see those scenes, um, and I agree, but. I think the characters were fun, but on purpose, set to be, you know, at arm's length, so that you only really cared about Alice, the main girl, the last girl. And that's pretty much what this is made up of. There's now the dream sequence at the end, and I want to give you full time to talk about that, Graham. Well, yeah. Uh, basically, we have the final girl, and she escapes um, on a canoe out in the middle of the river, and then she's dragged... Um, underneath the water by a 12-year-old zombie Jason. She wakes up, and, and late, they say, oh, no, that didn't happen. Yeah, she wakes up in a hospital, and she's like, what about the boy? What about Jason? Is he still around? And they're like, what are you talking about? You're a crazy person. All your friends are dead. Roll credits. If the film would have ended with her being dragged underwater, roll credits, that would have been the absolute uh, perfect way to end that movie. And unfortunately... It ends in the hospital. A lot of these thoughts will be revisited in further movies, but how about we just jump into part two? Sounds great. Graham, I'm going to time you this time once again for the 30-second summary. Do you think you can do it? I think I can probably do it in about 10 seconds. How about that? 10 uh, seconds? Yeah. You really think so? Okay, well so. then, on your mark... Get set and go. These kids go to a camp and they get killed by Jason. Wow. But do they all get killed? Uh, no. They're, y yes, they do, actually. 
<laughs> uh, yes, they do. Um, not there, true. Not true. That is false. Well, um, in so, this film, in number two, yeah. Okay, so I I remember the ending is Jason breaks through a window and grabs the final girl, and we remember, but then they're carried out by stretchers and stuff, right? Oh, after that. they do another dream thing. You're right. Yep. You're right. Okay, gotcha. So there is because they still didn't know what to do. So yeah. yes, there's a survivor. I think they both survived, and the goofy comic relief guy stays at the bar and gets drunk with the other people from town and never goes back to camp. So he didn't die either. Yeah, so that's kind of a um, a lesson learned. Um, if you have a chance to go to a bar, stay there. You never know if you're going to go back to the house and see all your friends fucking murdered. Especially uh, if you've all been drinking. Yeah, that was really irresponsible. But kudos to the guy that stayed at the bar. Or he found another bar. He's like, isn't there an after hours place? Yeah, he went to the after hours bar. Okay, gotcha. But um, so, Rob, tell me the big difference um, in this version of Jason as opposed to all the other uh, films. Uh, he is a fi- he looks physically different. Sure, he's an adult now, and he's got a bag on his head. It's a bag similar to the villain in the town that dreaded sundown. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's actually not that good, but and I have not. Yeah, you you could probably skip it. it it's good, not great. I mean, hey, you know what, okay. Graham? I probably will. Yeah, there you go. Check it out, just to spite me. I should also note that we're I I'm recording in New York and you're recording in Austin, Texas, and it's getting to be about rush hour on my block. So if you hear some horns, so sorry. What do you think? You know what? I was going to ask you what your uh, you thought stood out in this one or made it different. But Graham, I got really into the thick of this one thought, and I and I need you to just bear with me through these points I'm about to make. Okay. But uh, I think you'll understand what I'm getting at by the end of it. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll hang in there. Here. Yeah. Here we go. First movie was a murder mystery who done it, and we find out. Oh my gosh! It was actually. His mother, correct? Correct, question mark, yes. So wouldn't that lead you to believe, and you have to block out any of your current knowledge, any of the knowledge you had going into it, Uh there was only one movie before this. Uh Uh-huh. Wouldn't that lead you to believe that the second movie would also be like a whodunit because you don't see the killer? True, yeah then wouldn't the idea of it being Jason and wouldn't planting that seed of it being Jason be another red herring to that original audience? So they'd go and watch it thinking it's a whodunit and going, oh, of course we're supposed to think it's Jason. Then it is Jason. Do you think that let people down? Like, well, what do you think that experience was like? It's hard to say. Um, I think after the first film, upon hearing there was going to be a sequel, I think people were expecting Jason to be the killer, but sort of um, holding back on that thought maybe while watching the movie because it could be somebody else. Um, well, I don't know. I, I think that's... I just think that it's made too obvious that it's going to be Jason that a somewhat even partially sophisticated audience would be like, oh, they wanted us to think it was a man in this other one, and now they want us to think it's Jason in this one. Yeah, it... If I'm if I'm remembering this correctly, towards the the first act of the film, there's a campfire scene where oh God, yeah. the main guy is basically saying, "Hey, Jason's the killer in this movie, not the mother." You know, we're we're gonna pay that off because I, 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 I well, and here's the thing: it was a surprisingly accurate story with details. There's no way yeah. he would have known. And and it is like that is what happened, but it's told as if it's a campfire tale, which also makes me think like, oh, why would you believe that? Yeah, exactly. Um, and the fact that the last time that we saw Jason, he was probably 12 years old. The very last scene of the first film. I'm a, I'm a guessing 12. He looked about 12 years old. But it was a dream sequence, so we can't even throw that in there, remember? That's like, true. That's true. It's hard to to sort of figure out what's real or not real in these films. I'm totally okay with Jason didn't drown in the prologue or part one, 
He, she just thought he drowned, went crazy, but he washed up on the other side of the lake and grew up a feral child, and here he is in part two. You look at the studio that released these films, it's Paramount Pictures, you know, and I don't know this for a fact, I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing this out there, but I imagine there were some studio executives that were really embarrassed by this franchise and they couldn't say no to it because it was making the studio money but at the same time it's kind of like oh okay we'll just quickly make this and see if it makes any money and kind of little thought went into it and i think the template just got more clean cut in this one it's like okay we know what works and so this time when you've got like they're gonna just go with what works and that's why you see more of like sexualization and the more cookie cutter, have sex, die. Here's the jock asshole, but who's also over sexualized. And then this hot woman who's over sexualized, and this other woman who wants to sexually seduce the guy in the wheelchair. What's represented in the first one was that you don't have to have sex to die. Um, the main character, Smoked Pot, was in a relationship with a much older man. She wasn't a virgin. You know, like people who were sure. not getting any died, and people who were getting some died. And now it's just like that. Okay, you you get some, you die. It's a good ending of that sentence. That being said, can I tell you real quickly uh, my favorite scene in part two? Of course. And watching this as a kid, it's just stuck in my brain for some reason. There's a, sh- a close-up shot of a woman walking down a trail, and it, the camera's like right on her butt. And then she gets shot with a, sh- a slingshot. And the guy is so nonchalant about shooting her with the slingshot. He's just kind of like, hey, what's going on? And she's like, He doesn't oh. say anything, actually. He, winks. he says that in his eyebrows. Yeah, and I think he like winks at her. And she's like, oh, you. And she keeps on walking down the trail. And for, uh, she's, she should have knocked him out. Yeah, sure. And I mean, the scene is just very bizarre. I guess it's like, hey, two attractive people. Let's hope they fuck soon after they'll die i mean what does that say about us that we're that we're watching these films and we're rooting for these kids to have sex and do drugs and then die like i don't know if it's rooting as much as like people just want to see the elaborate special effect death scenes like how people got really excited about a magician sawing someone in half sure okay that's actually a really good point rob and i'll follow that with saying I know Tom Savini did the special effects in number one. I cannot remember if he did number two. Uh, I apologize to our audience. But don't you think it's a shame that whenever Tom Savini does his best work, I mean, when he really is just so passionate about what he's doing and really gets into it, that he's punished for that by the MPAA because they cut all of his hard work out of the film. Well, I think it's like a fairly accepted thought that part one kind of slid through and so they were very much more um restricted in parts two and three and you know i'm sure it eased up a bit a little later but well that's kind of the running thought you're dead on um in parts two and three the violence is really sort of stripped down that being said three has like one of the biggest body counts of the entire series But I believe Tom Savini came back in part four and the gore is back to a degree. Again, uh, the MPAA has really uh, uh, hurt his career, in my opinion. And I really like to quickly say here at Pumpkin Spice Podcast, Mr. Tom Savini, we salute you. Rob, this is a bit off topic, but when you were a kid, did you ever get kicked out of a movie? No. For for being underage? Nope. Never once. That really pisses me off because it happened to me at least three times. Really? Yeah, in Kansas. Man, well, I grew up in Missouri, which is worse, but... But they were like uh, stupid movies to get kicked out of. Like, dude, I got kicked out of Enemy of the State. Oh, my God. With Will Smith and Gene Hackman. and That's, That's almost a favor. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. I mean, well... I think that movie is kind of a sequel to Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation, but we'll get into that. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But um, I wanted to say that that movie was kind of it was it was kind of hilarious that that was what I was kicked out of because it granted it is rated R. It's pretty tame as far as the violence and the uh, adult subject matter. So I, I have no idea why because uh, I, I walked into the theater and I. I think I heard someone say, hey, that guy's too young to be in the theater. And then an usher came and kicked me out. 
and did what a, not what and a prick. and to add, add insult to injury did not refund my money for the ticket they sold it to you yes and my parents were no they were not around when i bought the ticket oh my god i digress let's get back into friday the 13th so you said the butt shot was like your weird scene, which was definitely one of my weird scenes too. I do, you know, sometimes we say best kills, sometimes we say, you know, weird stuff. I would say that like the ending, I, I'm pretty sure that like part of it was cut in the theatrical release, but it, it what was left makes almost zero sense, which we touched on it at the beginning of this episode. Uh, but there's like a shrine to Jason's mother in like Jason's jack shack. I think the the head of his mom was supposed to be smiling and the eyes open at the end. That's what the stories say. But it just looks like he's been worshiping his mom and maybe the other guy died. But then everyone's taken out in a gurney. Yeah. Um. As far as like Jason's home goes, that, that shack, I thought that was a wonderful set. And seeing like the lit candles around his mother's severed head um that was a really terrifying thing to see as a kid um and it's oh man when the when the like sheriff or whatever discovers it scariest scene in the movie possibly possibly i also think it sort of shows the connection between you know i've always i always saw a connection with uh the friday the 13th films and the movie psycho in a sense with like the mother's relationship to the killer but the film, especially in number two and one, sort of harken back to the universal uh, monster movies of the 1930s, where you have the older generation warning the younger generation. For example, when the teenagers show up to Camp Crystal Lake, all of the older people are like, oh, you're you're in danger. This place is is spooky. You better well, leave. The old like Greek like Oedipus story. Sure. And I just wanted to point out that the, the older guy. Go- the older, yeah, the prophet sort of guy is, um, and Alice are the only two characters from the first film that are in the sequel. And we actually see the old man from the first film die. And in, I think that's a film. pretty good, like, explanation of, like, how they're going to set the trajectory of this series. It's like, well, if this guy could foresee what was going to happen. Let's just get rid of him so we can do whatever the hell we want with this series. The main character in this one, what's her name? Amy? No, uh, Jenny Field. Jenny so, Field, yeah. I think she is an amazing leading actor in this movie and has so much more depth and like confidence. Not that Alice didn't have that, because she did, but like, I feel like this is the leading woman that we needed in a film that wasn't very good. She's sure. independent. She's a child psychologist. She uses that to her advantage at the end of the movie and is just well thought out and a damn good actor. Yeah, I, I totally... It takes um, a, a strong performer to put on that gross sweater yeah. um, at the end of the film. She puts on Jason's mother's, uh, Mrs. Voorhees' sweater. Um, and I, for a second, I thought that she was going to tuck her head under, you know, uh, oh, and, and put the, the, like, the weird, like, yeah, basically on, on top of her head, you know, um, that didn't happen, but it would have been, uh, it would have been pretty cool, but, uh, maybe not scary as it would have been funny. Do you think Beetlejuice reused some of those props? Um, I think that Tim Burton was probably inspired. Oh, I'm himself. sure. I yeah. am sure. Well, Graham, we pretty much covered A to Z of part two and part one, but of course, if anyone wants to reach us, they can find me on Twitter at Rob K. Schulte. That's R-O-B, the letter K, S-C-H-U-L-T-E. I'll forward you the messages because I think we just need a buffer zone, don't you? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, send us uh, your questions on the podcast, uh, your thoughts and uh, recommendations, anything like that. Let us know. But I mean, Grim, if you want to give your email, feel free. I, I probably won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any final thoughts on what we've uh, watched so far in the series? Well, it's kind of, you know, I have a different relationship to these films when I first watched them as a kid 
um, as opposed to watching them in, as an adult. And I don't think they hold up as well, but I can't lie. I absolutely love these films. There's just something about seeing um, a guy in a hockey mask walk around at night. Um, and um, honestly, I think a lot of the the films are, are really well fro- photographed. Um, they're competently made films for the most part. And um, again, I think looking at the first two films, I, I've never heard anybody say, oh, these are great films, but more sort of an appreciation of what the film started. This might have had a few missteps in it, and they didn't know what they were doing, much like A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. But for what they are, they're still fun to watch. Sure. And Nightmare on Elm Street 2 is like a beautiful disaster. Oh, it's so um, good. Yeah, you can watch that movie over and over and over again. Um, these first two Friday the 13th films are good, but I don't know if you'll be re- re-watching them uh, over and over again. And Jason Takes Manhattan, that might on repeat. Fuck that movie. <laughs> Fuck that movie. And with that, <laughs> we will see you all next time for another installment of Pumpkin Spice Podcast. Make sure that you tell your friends and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It's the best way that any sort of fan can help us whatsoever. It just bumps us up, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. Tell your friends, tell your parents, tell your grandparents. Tell us, tell them about the show. They'll love it. You're going to learn something. I encourage anyone else out there listening to this podcast to give money to the hurricane relief or anything, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We should probably just take it one second to give a shout out to the people of Houston, amazing people. And um, I'm donating a bunch of clothes to HEB. So if you're in Texas, HEB stands for, Rob, here everything is better. And it's it's sort of the grocery train chain that pretty much has a monopoly all over texas but the great thing about them is that they have this huge convoy for um sort of uh hurricane relief or natural disaster relief so they do a great job of helping people out during a natural disaster so if you can support heb give all the your food and clothing to these uh people and try to help out as best you can